Welcome to the New England Real Estate Journal, State of the Cree Market in Massachusetts. I'd like to introduce you to our panel for today. Our moderator, Dave Gambasini of Excel Capital Partners. Michael Chase from Northmark. John Pentor from Horvath and Tremblay. Shyla Matthews from Mass Development. And here are I am, I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England Real Estate Journal. I'd like to thank our corporate sponsors, Northmark, U.S. Pavement Services, Inc., and Excel Capital Partners. All right, and now we have the panel. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Dave Gambasini from CCIM and Excel Capital Partners. Excellent, thank you. Um, appreciate uh, the introduction and being here today. Um, I am Dave Gambasini, uh, president of the New England CCM chapter and principal with Excel Capital Partners. And we have a, uh, a, a great panel today. Um, it's gonna, I might actually, I think I'm gonna call an audible on all my panelists. We, we actually received, I've never seen so many questions from the audience before an event. So I may hit you guys with a with a list of questions and, and we may kind of go a little sideways from what we originally planned. But I would like to introduce our panel and get right into the conversations. And I'm going to start with uh, John Pintori, Executive Vice President of Horvath and Trembley. John, if you'd like to say a couple words. Yeah, how's everybody doing today? Nice to meet everybody. Um, happy to be here. I'm glad that NERJ invited us to all be here today and be a part of this panel. <clears throat> uh, NERJ does a great job, and we had a, a very uh, long relationship with them over the years. Uh, my specialty is in the sale of uh, multifamily mixed-use investment properties uh, in the private client space, uh, really between a million and 25 million. Uh, we have a team of guys. I run the multifamily group with my partner, and we have a team of guys spread throughout the um, Massachusetts into New Hampshire and, and Connecticut as well. And we do have new offices opening up uh, in Florida and out in Chicago. Um, but we have um, a ge different geographical uh, cover spots, I would say, from the North Shore of Boston to Merrimack Valley, into the Manchester, New Hampshire market, to the South Coast, to Metro West, to Greater Boston. So we cover a, uh, a wide swath uh, of, uh, of multifamily sales in this private client space. So Happy to be here and answer any questions uh, anyone uh, may have. So Excellent. Thank you, John. And with mass development, we have Shala. Shala. How am I doing? Shia, I, I think I know Rick because he doesn't know where Worcester is, but I can't even say your name and I know you. Shia Rufer Matthews, CCIM, uh, Vice President, Community Development in the Central Region for Mass Development. Shia, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do with mass development? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Well, Dave already introduced myself, but it, my name is Shyla Rufer Matthews. I'm Vice President of Community Development at Mass Development. We're the state's economic development and finance agency. I'm also a CCIM, like my co-panelists, and a moderator, which means that my background training is in the financial mechanisms of commercial real estate. Thank you to Rick Kaplan and the New England Real Estate Journal for this opportunity to come before you today and talk about the state of commercial real estate in Massachusetts. I'm also excited to be here before you virtually today on the precipice of the reopening of the state. Although once uh, we do get back together in person, you'll, you'll find out that I'm only five feet tall <laughs> as opposed to what my Zoom background look, makes me look like. Uh, using that, I'm, I'm, I'm a little sad to have everybody meet me. But <laughs> in my role as a community development officer for Mass Development, I work with my team to provide entrepreneurial real estate and financing solutions to a wide range of projects to create economic opportunities in Massachusetts. Our staff is located in offices throughout the Commonwealth, and I'm joined by several of my colleagues today from, from all the regions. And, and I'm located personally, as we all talked about earlier, I'm located out of the Wor Worcester office, so I handle the central region for the state. Jane, J J I want to quote to you guys um, something that I think is really important for everybody to think about as we find ourselves in this moment in time in commercial real estate in Massachusetts. Jane Jacobs once said in a perfect quote in, in this moment in time, cities need old buildings so badly, it is probably impossible for vigorous streets and districts to grow without them. For really new ideas of any kind, no matter how ultimately profitable 
or otherwise successful, some of them might prove to be, there is no leeway for such chancy trial error and experimentation in the high overhead economy of new construction. Old ideas can sometimes use new buildings. New ideas must use old buildings. So right now, this pandemic is teaching us the power of community and the power of what community means to those choosing to live here in Massachusetts. So I look forward to this discussion with my colleagues and I look forward to hearing from everybody about what you're seeing out there in the commercial real estate industry. So thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Excellent, Shiloh. Thank you, Michael. This is gonna be a tough act to follow. Uh, Michael Chase, CCIM Managing Director and Senior Vice President of Debt and Equity with Northmark. Let us, uh, let us know a little bit about what you do, Michael. Great. Thank you, David. And also thank you to New England Real Estate Journal for the opportunity to be here this morning to speak with you. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'm, uh, my name is Michael Chase. I'm the Managing Director for the Boston Regional Office of Northmark. We're a capital markets intermediary. We provide debt and equity solutions to our clients for income producing real estate. We do that through directly representing Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA for multifamily properties. Uh, we also have a, a stable of over 50 life insurance companies and pension funds that we act as a correspondent lender for, as well as all of our relationships with banks, Wall Street firms, other open uh, life insurance companies. What we like to tell our uh, what we like to tell our clients is that we can provide them a comprehensive view of the capital markets. So they can see uh, what kind of capital is available from all the sources, whether they be institutional, banks, private debt, private wealth. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk about the state of real estate in Massachusetts. And like Shiloh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the reopening here happening uh, on, on May 29th. So thank you again for having me. Excellent. So like I said, I know we've, you know, as a panel, so you guys understand, the audience understands, we get together and, and we talk about um, you know, kind of topics and, and what we, how we want to kind of steer the conversation to make it engaging and, and interesting for the audience. Um, so we have some topics and I'm going to, we're going to certainly touch on those, but what, what was really interesting, and I did say that we did receive a lot of questions before this. And, and I, and I, I understand, right. There's a lot that's now changed. We're at, you know, we're over a year into this pandemic thing and, and a lot has changed and the questions are, are evolving, right. It, it, they used to be a little more, you know, they used to be front loaded of what now, what do we do? How do we do it? Now it's more the <clears> tail end of, okay, what happens next? So uh, I'm going to, John, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you a specific question. You and I talked about a little bit. Um, and then I want to lead right into the audience questions. And, and that way, you know, look, I, I think what's most important is the folks that are sitting out there that ask these questions, that they can hear their questions being asked and, and we can give some color <laughs> to it. So I'll, I'll come and go in and out of some of the topics we discussed and then some of the audience stuff. And hopefully that, that'll keep everyone um, interested in, in what we're talking about here. So, John, a big thing that, that hasn't let up, in general, obviously, when we talk about real estate and the pandemic, everything changed, we know it, right? We, they flipped the script on everything. And, you know, it's great to have you here today because there was this, there was this concern, there was this question of what would happen in the multifamily markets when it happened, right? And, and, it, and it unraveled, and I won't, I won't try to talk about it, but in general, now that you're, we're over a year into this, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe walk us through, not as much as what happened at the beginning, but if you want to set it up as, hey, this is what we saw, and then kind of bring us right to where we are today, what, you, what you've seen and, and, and where, you're, where we're at. And, and as far as multifamily, of course, when we're talking about um, a lot of what we do on, on, on uh, the folks that are attending today, there's, we all have some type of business or might have some type of business that touches that market or know people in these in these buildings. So I'm just curious, where what kind of impact has COVID had? What's the roller coaster ride with with COVID on the multifamily market? Yeah, it's certainly been uh, it's certainly been quite a ride, right? A lot of it unexpected going back to a year ago. I think uh, the, the one word I, I will say with Boston and beyond and into the suburbs is it's, it's the multifamily space has been very resilient. You know, if you go back to a year ago when this pandemic first happened and, and you're on a lot of these, you know, conference calls and Zoom calls, people talking about the state of the market. You know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, the commercial classes that people were focusing on that were going to weather this storm were really industrial and multifamily. And I think you've seen that uh, stay pretty, pretty stable. You know, going back to last year, I think I had a conversation with someone that was very much in the know. I think it was probably early last spring, looking back into to May. And he was saying it before things started a little open up a little bit more after the, the two-week lockdown per se but he mentioned geez can you imagine if the students don't come back 
this fall, meaning the fall of 2020. And I said to him, I go, that just seems crazy. Because at the time, I think a lot of us felt this wouldn't last as long as it did. And then sure enough, as you know, we got into May and June, there was some, you know, the COVID rates were starting to go down a little bit as we got into the summer months and people were outside. And, and, and all of a sudden the school started to say, well, we're not going to be coming back in the fall. And all the students aren't coming back. And, you know, the international students aren't coming back. And then people were, were moving out to, to the suburban markets. You know, there wasn't a huge impact in, I would say, greater Boston at the time based on these decisions. I'll, I'll, I'll take that a step back. There was an impact in the rental market. Right. So a lot of those uh, areas that were more um, uh, they were reliant on the colleges um, close. You know, there's 40 schools within within the city of Boston or outside the city of Boston. So when those students didn't come back, those markets were certainly hit with the rental market. And we certainly saw a big drop, a raise in, a rise in vacancy rates and a drop in, in the rental market. Um, you know, as we got further into the winter and, and the rates started going back up, there certainly was more a, uh, of a uh, concern of what was going to happen with COVID. But I still think overall, based on, you know, Boston and, and greater Boston and beyond, you know, it's very resilient because it's a different Massachusetts and, and Boston are, they're different than where things were 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's now a world-class city. And that has a ripple effect into the, the suburban markets too. You know, you see a lot of companies moving into Boston. Look, we have some of the greatest hospitals in the world here in Boston. We have all these universities. Those have always been here. But you've seen a big uptick in, in life science and biotech and lab space, which is bringing jobs to the area, too. So I think, you know, overall, the outlook is good on multifamily. I don't think anybody will say to you, well, gee, especially in greater Boston, that the rental market is going to be what it was back in 2019. Um, I think, you know, obviously, as we as we recover this fall, as students come back and you know, the vacancy rates are going to drop um, and, and demand is going to return. But it's going to take some time to absorb all those apartments. It's really going to be better than it was last fall. Um, but I think overall, the outlook is strong for multifamily uh, from greater Boston and, and even into the suburbs. We feel the suburbs have fared very well. Um, we haven't seen uh, a drop off in the rents. We've seen a part of that being people were moving from, from the city, moving outside to, to the suburban markets. Uh, but those areas have stayed very strong. And I think another factor that played into the, the, the steadiness of the multifamily space is, you know, interest rates have stayed low. So there's still buyers out there that realize that it's a favorable interest rate market. I think, and Michael could touch on this too, more lenders are coming back into the space in the, in the, in the lending environment. I think last year with the, all the banks being tied up with the PPP loan process, um, they weren't focusing as much on multifamily, but you know, now the lenders are coming back in too. So I think the overall outlook for multifamily is strong. Um, there are some ripple effects and, and maybe some deals are getting a little bit more complex as you navigate through the due diligence process. And as you get to the, once you put it on agreement, you get to the close. But, you know, again, I think we're, our outlook and from the buyers that are out there, uh, it's overall, it's, 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 it's strong. Um, and we, we look forward to the recovery uh, as we go, but um, don't think it's been as drastic as people thought it might be. Sure. And Michael, I want to get to you in a second. I'll tee you up for, uh, I want to talk about, rates, programs for multifamily. But John, in terms of trading, what's the demand been? Have you see, did you see a slowdown initially of, of those who were wanting to trade um, uh, apartments? And have you seen that change? Has the demand gone back up to some degree of wanting to get back into trading these assets? Yeah, I think there's, I think this, this pandemic is certainly um, the old timers. You know, a lot of our clients in the private client space, they've owned these properties for 30, 40, 50 years. And they got to a point where they just, you know, they have some vacancy and they're getting tired of the management and they just don't want to live through the next cycle. Um, so I, I, I do feel there's there's certainly some opportunity that's out there uh, in terms of inventory, whether it's on market or off market. Um, so that's that's helped. I think the one thing that we have seen um, is I think buyers, there's still ample amount of buyers that are out there looking for deals because of the interest rate market. And there's certainly some opportunity. But, you know, I think uh, the novice buyers, now is not the time for them to jump into the real estate. So whereas what you saw in COVID, well, prior to COVID, back in 17, 18, 19, when everything was hunky-dory and the market was on fire, you had a lot of people looking to get into real estate. They wanted to buy their first deal. They were trying to raise capital. And you had all these novice buyers come to the marketplace. I don't think there's a, as many of them right now, not to say that's not going to return, but I think people are being a little bit more choosy on what they buy and what they offer on uh, but, you know, before we would have deals out the market prior to COVID where you're getting 15, 20, 25 offers, right? 
Whereas now we don't see that right now. We're still getting into situations where there's multiple bids. Um, there's just not as many offers as we're getting, but um, you know, sure. Yeah. And Michael, so if we jump over to you, you know, to, to, tag on to what, what we're talking about with John here. What are you seeing in terms of the rates, either in general and or anything specific for, for multifamily markets? Knowing we had a lot of the PPE, the eviction notices, all these, you know, they were giving forgiveness on, on rents. Where do you see as far as the lending? Is there any apprehension on the lenders to continue to lend and, and help us frame that a little bit as far as the programs and rates? Sure. Um, I guess I'll start a little bit at the on broad level and we'll narrow it down. Right now, the, the 10 year treasury is just under 1.60%. Uh, the treasuries have remained low, rates have remained low. Um, some of the news headlines were that the 10 year treasury has been up about 65 basis points since the beginning of the year. Um, however, a lot of that has been offset by a compression in the spreads. The corporate bond market has been uh, very favorable. And as an alternative uh, means of investment for lenders, you know, the triple B corporates are only trading at an 80 basis point spread over treasuries. Um, that's in 50 basis points from where they were at the beginning of the year. And double A corporates are only trading at 20 basis points spread over treasuries. It means that lenders don't have an alternative investment. So they're putting their money into mortgages. So while the treasuries have been rising, spreads have been coming in. The, the bottom line is rates have remained low. It's been a good environment for borrowers. Now, going forward, certainly inflationary and upward pressure on rates can't help but uh, be upward pressure. The Treasury is printing a lot of money. The, the, the supply of money has ballooned incredibly. The Treasury is continuing to issue bonds. Um, the good, um, the positive news on that front is global markets still are demanding U.S. Treasuries. There are still a lot of, uh, a lot of other sovereign bonds. Germany is still trading negatively. Their 10-year bond is trading negatively. Yeah, Japan, uh, United Kingdom, Spain, Italy, both, all those treasuries are below the U.S. Treasury. So corporate uh, money flows, they're still coming into the U.S. Treasury, kind of keeping a cap on the rise of our local rates, our domestic rates. Um, so in general, there is upward pressure, but there's a, a bit of a cap on it. And the rise in treasuries have been offset by spreads, keeping rates relatively low. In terms of multi, the multifamily market, as John mentioned, it, it is one of the asset classes of choice for lenders right there with industrial. Um, that market is always led by the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, um, keep, that, keep the debt market for that uh, very tight. Um, they remain incredibly focused on anything that's mission driven, particularly for affordable or green. Uh, they had to pull back maybe a little bit on the market rate side because of their uh, caps and mandates but there's been an incredible risk on stance from the bridge cap, from the bridge lending market that's kind of filled that void for acquisition financing. And the rest of the capital uh, is still chasing multifamily very hard. Rates are very aggressive and terms are very aggressive for multifamily. If I can, if I can touch on that too, and I'll give a couple of examples of what he's talking about, you know, the interest rate environment for in the multifamily space. You know, we sold a few deals recently uh, in, in greater Boston, just to give a couple of examples. Uh, one building was more of a value add variety, um, you know, your, your big bro brick box, sub $10 million price point, you know, low, uh, below market rents, um, you had some value add component to it too. We're going to do kitchens and bathrooms to bring the rents back up to, you know, where the market's probably a, a two year period, but, you know, that lender was able to get, you know, rates at, at three and a half. And then we just sold a different building where uh, it was a, a stabilized uh, deal, um, rents right at market, most of the Building was fixed up. It was actually a, a mixed-use component, so it had some, um, you know, a few units had some office and some retail, and then you had apartments up above. But the building was fully occupied, uh, and that that sponsor, that that borrower, was able to get a rate of three and a quarter. So there is good debt out there. I think so. A lot of our conversations that we've been having when buyers are looking at deals, and they say, you know, we ask them, you know, where are you seeing rates with your 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 banks, and they're talking. Well, I think you know they're they're guessing into the force. Um, and you do see that on the construction side and, and child, I'm sure we'll touch on that too. But, um, you know, when you're looking at the multifamily private client space, you know, there is certainly good debt options out there for buyers and borrowers. Um, and that's something that we certainly try to, whether working with Michael or, or other lenders that we know, um, or, you know, loan shops, um, they can find a debt to make these deals work. And, you know, now's the time to take advantage of that environment because we don't know where things are going to be, you know, a year from now. So, um, 
in a number of different factors, but sure. uh, we can get into that later. But yeah. Sure. Shiloh, I'm going to come to you in a minute, um, talk about what you and I were talking about last week on the development side for specifically multifamily. So, but Michael, before I let you go, here was a question that had come in early. Um, is the current threat of inflation overstated or imminent? What, what's your ideas on that? I think it, uh, it's been understated by the Fed in many ways uh, because, you know, core inflation, they're, they're saying, uh, you know, leading before the April report, they're saying it hadn't reached 2% or was below their target range. But of course, core inflation doesn't include energy or food. And anybody who's been to the gas station recently realizes how much more it costs to fill your tank. So while core inflation uh, wasn't quite hitting that target range, I think the rest of us were feeling it. And, um, and again, the, the way the money supply has increased, the way uh, that they're issuing new debt, it's only bound to be inflationary. Um, so in some ways it's been understated. Uh, I do think it's going to have an impact here going forward. But as we mentioned earlier, there are a couple of reasons why there's a little bit of a cap and, and some things that are in our favor at the moment for keeping you know, our treasury rates from flying away. Uh, there's still a strong demand for the US dollar on a global basis, and that's helping us out for now. Sure. So, it, and I, I'll only explain, I'll, I'll tee this up as I have, I have a 251 unit multifamily development happening in, um, in Fitchburg and for, it's for sale actually, the, the developer wants to sell it. Um, and I've worked with Shiloh recently to understand programs that are available for developers. So Shiloh, perfect segue from multifamily and the lending side. What about mass development and programs? You know, maybe start us off with, with multifamily. And then if you wanna take it, you know, in general to help understand, because obviously, you know, the cost of, the, co the development costs are through the roof, right? Lumber, steel, labor, everything is just outrageous right now. So help us understand what, what mass development has for programs and assistance and what are you guys doing to try to help developers stay in the game and take advantage of some support? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited about that project in Fitchburg and hopefully uh, we are able to match or get uh, a developer onto that site because it would be absolutely transformative for um, to bring that much um, housing online. You know, I'm going to segue a little bit to say that housing, 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 the, you guys are talking about the, the finance market. We're talking about we need it. We need it. We need it. We need it in the state. You just have to continue to build. And that's why I was trying to bring everybody's thought processes to not just new build, um, because we are really seeing that um, unless the um, supply chains even out, which hopefully, fingers crossed, supply chains do start evening out um, for the new construction. We really need to think differently and how are you building housing into your downtown? So mass development is a gap financing. Um, that's our sweet spot. We really, we can do direct lending. We can go up to $7.5 million on projects, but really where our sweet spot is, is really sitting with you and understanding where are you finding the problems within that financing stack? Um, so we are a bond, a conduit bond issuer for tax, tax credits for housing. We're also, we can do direct lending, as I said, we can do guarantees. We can, we can just create that facilitation of that conversation with your bank and partner with your bank and see where the, the gaps lie within the, the financing structure. I want to also, because I think uh, I saw in the audience and during the networking, I also want to bring up our PACE program, C-PACE in Massachusetts that just went online um, and more and more communities are becoming um, adopting it, which is, which is financing for your energy upgrades for your property through, through property assessment. So it's really working with your banks to understand how to do that. And then also, so I think Salem just uh, adopted the program and we might have our first project up in Salem on that to really show the power of doing those different financing mechanisms. And then we, we have small um, boutique type uh, assistance to communities and really micro-focusing. Uh, Fitchburg is one of our transformative development initiative cities. And we're really work, working to enhance and strengthen the um, economic development activity happening within this within the community. 
Um, Dave constantly says to me, well, what does that really mean? Well, that really means just kind of helping you and figuring out where those, the, those gaps that, that lie in your development and also coming in and doing some technical assistance with the community um, to, to enhance that community. I tried to bring your thoughts to the fact that you're seeing in the multifamily housing you're seeing where people really want to live, right? Like it's it's actually, you need to start spreading further out and understanding where people are demanding new housing be built, which to us is everywhere. So whatever you'd like to do. So Dave, hopefully that that covered a couple just snip, snippets, yeah. but I think we just want to be in the conversation and see how we can enhance and help. Um, right. And it's and it's another perfect segue from, from a audience question was, um, what is the future of affordable housing in, in Massachusetts? So Shyla, John, I mean, in general, um, what's, your, what are your, what's your take on affordable housing? That's where mo most yeah. of the, 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 the programs really lie around is understanding yeah. how do we enhance building more affordable housing. We can do market rate, but we also really want to see more and more affordable housing within our, our communities. And bring that up to, you know, I said to Dave, I'm like, I have no idea how people are affording everything. And, and this can't continue. We have to create more and more housing to make it more affordable for everybody. It's no longer workforce housing or affordable housing. It's really just build the housing, just build as much as we can within the state. Yeah, it's all about, it's all, yeah, I, I, I agree. You got to build, I mean, this is going back again before the pandemic, but especially for Boston, it was always just Build just build more units. Build more units, and the more available units that are out there, it's gonna it's gonna help with the affordability of the, of the rental market. I think it's also important too. I mean, not that we'll get into naming names, but you know, in terms of certain towns or cities, some tend to be a little bit more uh, developer friendly than others, and I think that's very important in terms of building more units. I think it's if if the towns and communities that they want more affordable housing if they want more units out there to so people can afford the rents then these 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 cities and towns need to be more um amenable to that and i think it really starts there too and making it attractive for developers to do these types of projects because as you mentioned it's not especially right now the cost of steel and lumber and development is going through a roof um and it's, it's just got to make sense it's got to make sense yeah, um, and I, John had wanted me to name names, and I said, well, I, ne I never said name names. Definitely not name names. names. <laughs> no, definitely not naming names. But uh, I can I, I can actually tell you that almost every community wants to work with you, and and really understanding that marriage and partnership between the community and the developer is essential for your mm -hmm. success. Uh, and understanding how they want to do their priority sites that they want you to do the development on mm -hmm. and really helping to strengthen that. Then you bring all the affordable housing tax credits. You, you bring what, what uh, it was the HDIP, the Housing Development Incentive Program uh, credits into a project. You can bring all the different resources that a community can be, build to bring that forward. We're on the precipice of the closing of an application period I want everybody to kind of know about right now is the Massachusetts One Stop for Growth, Community One Stop for Growth. Um, you just go on to the mass.gov website and, and search One Stop. We currently have uh, a unique program that's out there right now to relook at these older buildings. It's called the Underutilized Properties Program. Um, it's actually grant funding. It's the first time we've ever put um, grant funding dollars into the redevelopment of, uh, of properties. So really look at that. That closes on June next week, on June 3rd. So it's really mm -hmm. tight, but I, I really did want to cover that and make sure you guys know that what the state is doing is saying, you really need to start looking at our downtowns. This is where people want to be they want to be outside of the major metropolitan areas and they want to look at some of these second tier cities and second tier regions and look to say, how can we do development in those, those areas? Yeah, so, I, and I, I want to, I, what, this is where we're, we'll take the curveball a little bit. A lot of the questions that, that, we're, that I'm seeing that, that had come in ahead of time are, are a little bit more generic in nature, maybe not so specific to to multifamily or, or what we might be talking about. So I'm gonna tee one up and, and I'm gonna just talk on it quickly. If, if I understand it correctly, it might have an element of, of hotel. Um, and I happen to be engaged in a few projects. So I'll just touch on it and then open it up to you guys. 
Um, and we'll, you know, look, we're, we're all professionals in this. And I, I think we can bring, bring some light to a lot of, you know, a lot of office questions, um, trends questions. So we'll get into that. Um, how do you see the need for personal offices evolving as work from home, hoteling, and the effects of COVID continue? I'm not clear if it's a question about the hotel industry. Um, I'll just give a, give a little synopsis. We, it, at the beginning of the pandemic um, last year, I'd say January, February, I had, I had two or three hotel projects that were trying to come ground up. One was a, a, an enormous hotel convention center um, and the others were just, uh, one was a boutique hotel and the other was just a, you know, your standard uh, uh, name brand hotel. And they were all at the early stages, the pandemic set in, you know, we were ramping up, getting ready to go for permits in, um, in, in January, February, and then everything blew up and those just went offline, right? They may come back. They haven't yet. Those, those groups haven't come back to us specifically to say, okay, we're back. However, there is an uptick. There was a, there was pent up demand. We, I have a hotel um, at, a, at a big place in, in New York that we lost funding on. We lost debt last year. The, 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 the lender pulled their debt and we went without debt and we didn't end up breaking ground last year like we thought. That came back online in the fall and we just, we just closed on, on, call it 40 million of construction debt um, to go vertical. So that project came back online and that's going vertical. Locally, between, uh, I actually call it New Hampshire and New Hampshire and Connecticut, we have a couple other hotel projects that are gaining a lot of traction, right? They're, they're, the, the attention that we're getting from lenders is, sure, a little bit of caution, but they understand these aren't coming online for 18 months to two years before there's really any, any need to, to worry about, uh, you know, filling the space. So, the lenders have at least some lenders are still saying that eh, they're not really there, but we're seeing we've seen an uptick in in the interest of hotel development. I can't say I know for for uh, for trading purposes, but for development, we've seen an uptick in an interest in the private equity and in the debt, um, and that's that's been interesting for us to see. And like I said, they're they're not in Massachusetts, but generically, um, that's my take on the hotel side of things is that. We are seeing an uptick in, in interest and they're loosening up a little bit on their restrictions regarding it and their fear of it. Um, so I'll open it up to you guys as far as what you think of the, the work from home and the personal offices and going back. And that'll actually, there's, there's several questions that follow that, that we can kind of get into if you guys feel comfortable going there. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I think, so, sorry, Michael. I think that the question really rely uh, revolved around sort of collaborative workspace programs and, and different things that, that we have done. And we've worked, um, the Baker Polito administration has worked really hard to strengthen the innovation infrastructure in the, in the Commonwealth and really build up the collaborative workspaces with no knowledge that we were gonna head into a pandemic and everybody was gonna wanna work at home, but really it does speak to the future of that. And we're seeing strength in that market. We're actually about to open up uh, next week, our uh, collaborative mm -hmm. workspace program grant grant round for this next round. This will be our sixth round of that that program, and that does fit out and of spaces. And also, we're opening up to seed grants this year to to look at the concept and and see how everything is working for everyone and how we can change that and how we can continue to support entrepreneurship and working out of these collaborative workspaces. I think people would like to be with other people. And so, but they're also, a lot of the corporations are making that decision to continue that future work would, might look a lot different than what it does right now. So, oh, sorry, Michael, I cut, cut into there and let you go ahead and, and speak. Uh, no, not at all, Shyla. I think you, you, you touched right on uh, where I was headed as well uh, and gave a lot of great detail as to well some of the programs that you guys are offering. Um, Dave, I, I completely agree with everything you, you said in terms of the hotel industry, uh, but I do believe that the question about hoteling was more about shared workspaces and, and the office strategy uh, that people are seeing going forward. And I still think that in many ways, uh, office occupancy and strategies are still being formulated right now. They're still in a very much of a to be determined. Um, I think the suburban office market is one where we are seeing higher occupancy levels, people returning to the office. I'm seeing full parking lots as I drive around and look at suburban office buildings. Um, downtown, I think the 
there's still some sublease space availability there. There's some direct leases availability there. I think companies are trying to make their decisions as to what will their, how will their staffing and workplace strategies be going forward? Will they be bringing people back? Will they be doing hybrid? Will they be doing hoteling and sharing workspaces within the office? Um, I, I find it interesting. People ask about, well, will we, will we remain virtual? And I think that while people have gotten comfortable with virtual working from home, um, when you have your first office meeting and your competitor or you know person in your office that you're competing for your next promotion with is in the office and sitting next to your boss in the conference room, you're probably going to get yourself into the office pretty soon after that. So uh, I, I do think people will be returning to the office. Uh, there, there will be some mix and hybrid use certainly we'll be talking about things such as hub and spoke and how that will work um one of the drivers certainly going to be for the downtown market is will there end up being any kind of queuing or access issues for getting to the upper level stories of a tower space um, if that should happen then that's going to certainly change things but if restrictions are lowered and people can get in and out of their spaces easily and efficiently and they're not having to wait 45 minutes uh, for limited access on elevators um, then they'll be, that will help return to office sooner. Yeah, I think the important word out of all this is, is just collaboration. Michael mentioned it and Charlotte mentioned it too. I think people, you want to collaborate. You want to be with people in the office space. I think I think some things that will change in terms of the overall office market is there's certainly some jobs that don't need to be into the office all the time, whether it's administrative stuff or, or accounting type uh, positions with companies. But, you know, I think overall, from a personal standpoint, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our team is back. We have an open workspace and as more people have gotten vaccinated, more people have returned. You know, I've been back in the office since uh, and I had the opportunity to do so since last June. And our, my company certainly put a lot of um, protective procedures in place. And we were coming back on a, a split initially where you know, it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then Tuesday, Thursday. So we're really trying to focus on you know, what the CDC and the state was saying at the time. Um, as some guys maybe didn't return, they were working from, from remote. Um, you know, I looked at my partner and I said, listen, I'm, I got two young kids at home and he's got two young kids. And, uh, you know, maybe it helps me sometimes when I'm negotiating a deal and I put my five-year-old on with a client and say, Hey, buy this building, which did happen over the, over the winter. But it was just nice to be back in the office and collaborate with my, my counterparts. Uh, you get a certain type of energy off working with people and you, uh, it's just a lot more, um, uh, it's a better environment as opposed to working in a small confined space in your house. So I think, you know, as we continue on, I think more and more people will come back. Um, but again, this thing has, this, this, this whole pandemic has been, you know, a shock to all of us. And I think on those initial calls that were happening, you know, last year, March and April, you know, no big CEO um, was going to say at that moment, listen, we're shutting down the office forever. I think a lot of people, as Michael said, want to see how things will evolve over time as, as we come back. But, you know, I do feel as we as we move on from this pandemic, I think more and more people will return to the office. Some might not and never will come back, but there's a lot of buildings to fill that are out there, a lot of office space. and There's only so much you can do with them. So, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful, but I guess time will tell. So, yeah. And, and regarding occupancy rates, combining a couple questions here, occupancy rates and market, um, one, someone specific was along the Route 3 quarter, someone else was asking along the 495 Beltway. How do you feel about those quarters as, as it relates to market trends and occupancy? Are you relating to, is it more towards office or is it multifamily or? I, I guess go with, go with what you're comfortable with. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, think, I'm assuming think, it's probably office, but I guess we can we can generalize it if you want or go. With yeah, that. I mean, I think I think you're seeing um, some weakening in the office market along the 495 belt. But what you're seeing is just that uncertainty, what's coming back, what's not. Um, so what we're seeing is actually a strengthening of some of those those big corporate um, campuses being retransformed. So uh, we're actually seeing several biomanufacturing companies looking at the 495 belt, really coming into the former campuses of some of the big tech companies that that have already pre-pandemic had had already moved out. So you're seeing that that shift. So you really have to look at those buildings. What are, what is the new use? What's the new demand along that area? Exactly. We're seeing ebbs and flows in both directions. We're seeing some companies moving back into the city because it's more affordable and they want to be, 
you know, in, in the center of it all. And they can go and buy a, a, an entire building and, and move back in from being out in 128. We're seeing other companies go hub and spoke and move their employees more out to the suburbs, closer to where some of them are buying homes. So we're certainly seeing it going in both directions. And then Shyla mentioned, you know, lab space has been one of the key drivers here in Massachusetts. Um, you know, recently and, and a hot topic being talked about, Cambridge has been tight, tight, tight in the lab space market. And now it's to the point where it's not recent, but it's, it's, it's been bubbling over. So there are pockets now forming outside Newton, uh, the seaport, uh, other close in suburbs are, you know, and so you have other people who are looking at lab space as a potential alternative to Worcester. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, trying to think about lab space as a potential alternative for, you know, reuse. Um, we, we certainly on the finance side, we want to look and see, okay, what is the sustainability of that use? Are you getting higher rents than you would normally get for uh, an alternative use? And will the next user be able to use it? You know, lab space in Cambridge is going to find the next user. Lab space in, you know, suburban market, is that going to be sustainable? Um, and we just want to, you know, we would, want to carefully look at that. Excellent. You guys actually incidentally answered a very specific question regarding biomanufacturing space and and what, what might be the next markets to see growth. So I think you guys just inadvertently nailed that question. So great job. I don't know if you're... Look I along 495 in Worcester, please, and, and yeah. continue outwards. But we yeah. really are developing. Um, I think there's some really interesting projects happening all along 495 and outwards. So you're seeing those spokes happen outwards from Cambridge. Really, uh, it, it just, we, we, again, back to that innovation infrastructure that, that the Kamala has been work, working on, you know, really supporting that growth in biomanufacturing in the Worcester market and out in suburban 495 region, just as much as we can, whatever we can do to try to help with that technical assistance mm -hmm. The communities to repurpose some of their 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 sites, technical assistance about water resources, things like that. They, those are things that at, we're looking at to try to do, and then also direct direct funding into into that work. Absolutely. And just, and just circling back real quick to the uh, in regards to multifamily and, and, and occupancy or vacancy rates, I think if you're looking at you know downtown Boston, the areas that are the vacancy rates were higher, obviously are, are higher than it was last year. Um, you know, areas that are more uh, reliant, like I said earlier, on the, on the colleges and the undergraduate students is, uh, and the international students, we're, they're still trying to figure that out for the fall too. As you get out to the suburbs, the, the, what we've seen, especially with a lot of our deals, is the, the vacancy rates are a lot lower in the suburbs. Um, so yeah. there's been you know, an influx of people moving out to the suburbs and getting out of the city, um, or for whatever reason they left last year. Um, but we do feel in a lot of the, the rental projections, there's gonna be probably a, a big uptick and we've already felt it already. And I'm not just talking downtown Boston, inside 128, sorry, Shiloh, but I'll get okay. out to, I'll get out the Worcester 299 and out that way, but- John, um, we'll get you out there. <laughs> I, I, listen, I'm from Connecticut. So I drive by, I stopped in Worcester. It's, uh, you know, uh, I've been in Boston for 20 years now, but when I go see my folks, I'll, I'm stopping in Worcester to say hello. But, um, you know, we feel that there has been already been an uptick in the, uh, in the rental market in areas that were really impacted, whether it was downtown or the Alston's or Cambridge or Somerville. There is starting, they are starting to feel some more applications coming in. They are starting to fill some units. I think what you will see as we get into the summer and things really start to get more defined as we move into the fall, especially with the schools, is you'll see uh, an influx of, of apartment rentals. And I think the vacancy rates are still going to be higher than they were back in 2019. And, and, and the rental rates are going to be not as high as they were in 2019, but there's, there is going to be a comeback. And I think a lot of people feel looking out to 22, 23, that it will be fully recovered by then in the condo market too. So um, there's definitely a lot of um, positivity with this. Um, so, you know, hopefully we come out of this. Not to right. dig into the, the, the suburban, you know, Metro West area, but we didn't have any drops in our rents. <laughs> no, it's been, it's, 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 it's been, you know, it's fantastic. So it's, uh, you know, it's, um, getting out to the suburbs and um, well, again chasing what community means to everyone really yeah. chase that in your your work that you're doing we're chasing how to create communities mm -hmm. and really
really working to focus on on that living situation. How do people like to live in their communities and strengthening that? So mm-hmm. that, that's really, I would say, chase that in your business. Chase where yeah. people and we and we have and we have a we have a deal under agreement that's out. You know, the Route Two corridor, it's 100 plus units. Um, I think we've had to go into all the units during our due diligence period, but um, there wasn't one vacancy, and the rental collections were good. So. I think it's a testament to the suburban markets too, uh, of where things are. So, great. And I'm going to put a couple questions together here. Um, I suppose this could be generically or specific, uh, if you'd like. Do you feel the pandemic changed habits, or just postponed them? And how much longer before we get back to normal? I will add, is there a normal? It- Who knows. Who knows? Well, we keep saying we want to grow back better, right? We want to yeah. do things better than what we were doing before. Right. I think when we first came together this morning, we talked about traffic and we talked about the, the risks to our markets, to what we're seeing as, as impediments to having yeah. a wonderful work environment. Yeah. I think yeah. when you're saying, uh, did it change habits or postpone things? In a way, I look at COVID as being an accelerator. Um, you had the retail space, which was already, you know, looking to evolve prior to COVID. They were already dealing with the so-called Amazon effect prior to COVID. Mm-hmm. When COVID hit, they had to shift and they had to shift even faster because now it, more and more people are doing their shopping online. Uh, more and more people are doing buying groceries online. So retail has to shift and, and, and they're saying, you know, those changing trends. Um, right. We've seen people leave the, the urban core to go buy houses. I mean, there was already a population of, you know, uh, what is it, Gen Gen Z at this point, or, you know, so oh, millennials, I'm sorry, it's millennials, the, the millennials who were coming of age and probably going to start looking to the suburbs to start their families. And that COVID just accelerated that. Yeah. So um, did it did it postpone some things? It may have, but I think in many ways it was an accelerator. And don't forget that people, while you're seeing, you were seeing, Michael was right, you were seeing that shift in retail before. What we're seeing is that strength in local, buy local. So really you're seeing people want that community. They want that downtown uh, ability and they want to shop in their locality from local providers. So it's really strengthening that and recognizing that, that it is not the solution to bring in in the the national retailers anymore. It's really building up who you have in your own backyard. And that's a lot of what we do through our transformative development initiative. And and that seems to be a huge strength in downtowns. Excellent. Michael, I'll come to you on this one. How are the new capital taxes projected to affect commercial real estate in the coming year and beyond? So when I hear that question, I'm thinking that it has more to do about, you know, 1031 exchange, uh, the sale of real estate, you know, capital gains taxes. So those are still very much in the proposal phase is my understanding. They, They haven't passed anything, but certainly an area of concern for commercial real estate investors as to how will they be able to transfer that wealth that's been accumulated over the years. I mean, the old adage, what's the ultimate tax strategy? Defer, 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 and then die. Uh, And then you get your step up in basis and you hand off the property to your heirs. Um, (laughs) With with some of these proposed changes uh, in the capital gains tax, in the the ability, in the estate taxes, you you may not be able to take advantage of, of that, quite that scenario, but Um, There are other strategies coming along. 1031 Exchange has been under fire. I've been hearing more recently about deferred sales trusts as being a potential opportunity there. So um, there are certainly other strategies that are coming about, coming on and we're talking about, but uh, we are keeping an eye on on certainly those things because they could have an impact and not just for the the wealthy, but just for, you know, the the average American who's who's got a home or got a, a small investment property and has been looking to How do they transfer that along to their heirs? Excellent. And Shiloh, this is something we've talked about before. I'll I'll go back to a topic that that, that has come up more than once in diversity, right? How do you bring diversity in a commercial real estate investor marketplace? 
And you guys have done some interesting initiatives with that, that I, I you know, before we run out of time, I want to make sure we touch on that. What, what, how can you help us understand that a little bit better? Well, I think everything that we're going to be doing into the future is really looking and being intentional on trying to do that. I, and it kind of touches on what I was saying about looking local, look local, everyone, you know, really look and, and see who you can build up in your, in your local communities to help strengthen their ability to go and get those financial resources, to get the lending, to, to continue to build on their, their uh, ability to access um, real estate and markets. So what we have done, um, we've had a couple past rounds of looking at de emerging developer cohorts. We've, we've brought in developers we've come to know uh, that are in the area that may have had one or two unit locations and that we're trying to build up and say, you can do this bigger and better and training them. And I think both looking at that, and I think the CCIM New England has also looked at educating everyone and, and bringing that education to as many people as we can to say, you can do this, you can look into it. And I, John was saying, it's not a time for new investors, but I, I kind of think it, it is. And I think it's an overinflated market, but I think it's a time that we can kind of really be intentional in helping people get into this uh, field. And I think there's, there's lots of, of ways we can look at this. So, yeah, just to, so just to clarify too, I certainly didn't say it was not a time for new investors. I just feel like there's, um, Maybe not as many novice or new investors yeah. are looking to, buy so we have buy to buy the so I certainly feel like we, we've had conversations recently with a few guys that a few guys and girls that have gone off on their own. They had the commercial real estate background and they're looking to raise capital and start their own fund and buy properties. I just feel like those new investors or those new buyer groups that are coming into the market are, are being very selective and careful with what they're buying as opposed yeah. to a couple of years ago, just jumping right in and just riding the wave. So I think that's where you see yeah. maybe a, a little bit of a drop off of those novice. Investors. Yeah, and we're gonna start doing a lot more of farming for that and watching and seeing where we can be as intentional as possible and trying to build up that, that, the, those markets. And yeah. I do believe that DEI along with ESG, envir you know, uh, environmental social governance are going to be themes that will be influencing and driving commercial real estate from you know, well into the future. And it's going to drive the, 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 the financing too. It's going to drive Absolutely. a lot of that. More and more banks are taking it upon themselves to start looking at what their ESG policies may be. More and more investment funds are creating investment vehicles for the types of investors who are looking to make sure that they are socially conscious in their investments. So there's going to be a market for those real estate properties that qualify as ESG. There's going to be a market for those companies and institutions that can manage their ESG policies and, and be, you know, um, to target themselves and be a position uh, for those socially conscious investors. Yeah. And John, I want to give you a last pitch here. What's, what do you see the long-term? You're, you're our multifamily resident expert. What's our, what's our long-term outlook from the multifamily market, greater Boston, beyond wherever, wherever you see it? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, especially here in Massachusetts, you know, into the, in, in New England, I think it's going to be strong. Um, I, th I, I feel that way. I think if you see a lot of reports that are coming out, uh, people feel the rental market and the, and the condo market will return. When we talk condos, we talk about developers who are buying these buildings and um, sell them off as condos too. But I think overall, I think when you look in Massachusetts, and I touched on it before, I just feel like Boston and, and beyond is a much different um, beast than it was back in the early 2000s. I think there's just a lot of economic drivers that will, will positively impact, um, you know, these, these these communities. And you know, when you have when you have job growth and and, and wage growth, uh, there's going to be demand to, to 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 rent and to buy. And I think it's going to be strong here. So I still feel that, you know, last year when they talk about multifamily and industrial being the drivers, I still feel that multifamily will remain strong. Um, and, you know, I don't specialize in the institutional space. That's not my uh, cup of tea in terms of multifamily, but we, we, we do hear the multifamily institutional space has been very strong, uh, especially in New England. Um, and I think that's just a testament to, there's a lot of maybe new capital coming in and they feel like multifamily, industrial, but multifamily, which is my cup of tea, um, is, is a strong driver for, for, for investment. So I feel like all in all, we're, we're, um, 
we're confident multifamily will stay strong. And I think as time goes on, hopefully some of the, the, the cost of construction come back down to earth and that should help too. And we hope interest rates will stay, you know, remotely low. And even if they go up, they're still going to be lower than what they, what the historical interest rates have been. So all in all, I, I think it's going to be, we're, we're going to do just fine with multifamily. So. Excellent. And Rick, I see you looming. Uh, I want to bring you back in and ask if there's any other questions that have come in that we can address before we wrap this up. I don't have any other questions. I just do have a couple of comments. You know, Michael was talking about people coming in because back to work because they're seeing competing with the other uh, people for promotions. So they want to be in the office. And I find it funny that John has gone to the office because he was competing with his five-year-old at home. Yeah, yeah. and three, and three. So and three. Uh, listen, I, I love being around my kids, but it's not always uh, effective when I'm working. So, uh, so there, there's another reason why people will start going back to the office. Perfect 100%, example. Hundred uh, percent. You know, I I also wanted to mention that you know it, we talked touched a little bit on the life science, and uh, you know. You're right. The, the the overflow for from Cambridge and Boston right now it's all going to some of the suburbs, especially towards the uh, uh, Middlesex area. Uh, you have Burlington, Woburn, Bedford, those areas. There's a lot of life science companies that are opening up in those areas, as well as going out to Worcester. Uh, you don't see as many going towards north or south right now, but I think that's going to probably start expanding somewhat as well. Uh, bottom line is, <laughs> I wouldn't give up on the city. <laughs> There's, the people, people still want to be in that Boston address. It's convenient to everything. Uh, it's great for people coming in from the airport, all kinds of other transportation, public transportation. So I, I don't give up on the city, and I've seen this in New York starting to come back alive again as well, because that's uh, it's the it's the major city, and mm -hmm. in Worcester, what's the closest airport to in Worcester? We have an airport, so yep. there there should be an announcement tomorrow from Jeff. Rick, thank you for we joining us from Rhode Island. Island. Get him out there. <laughs> Bring your baseball glove. <laughs> we yes. have an airport. Um, it, it has been uh, reduced reduced flights, uh, but there should be some announcements in the next few weeks uh, that that are positive. But the nearest would be Providence or Boston. I am flying out of Boston in June. Okay, and I will be traveling to Worcester in the next uh, couple of weeks just to see what it's all about because it sounds like it's it's a great place for Use GPS because you don't know where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> head down the pike. <laughs> well, there's GPS. I can. I'll find it. Please feel free to reach out. <laughs> you know, I I did go to Springfield. That's that's past Worcester. Yes, and, and my colleague. From I, I did go out there. Uh, you know, when they built the M, it was it the MGM? Yes, MGM. Yeah, MGM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say it, but I, I went there. I wasn't very impressed by Springfield. <laughs> Oh, Springfield is very impressive. And again, that's another community that will definitely work with you if you want to. That's definitely one of the communities I will name drop, uh, John, and say, please work with the community. They will do yeah. what they can to help you with their development there. Well, I will say one last uh, plug, especially for, for, for Worcester, but I think there's even going back before the pandemic, there was a lot of, um, you know, the cap rates had really compressed in, in greater Boston and downtown and even the, the Cambridge and Somerville and Charlestown and Medford, Waltham, Watertown. So, uh, you know, and, uh, buyers that had these investor metrics they had to hit, they started looking out into the suburban markets. Uh, and at first it was Chelsea and Everett and Malden and those areas too. But now there's a lot of uh, buyers that we know and clients that are looking out in Worcester. Uh, and there's some new new developments that have been announced out in Worcester. So, look, they have metrics they have to hit, and they want to go to suburban markets that have good, you know, transportation and, and, and jobs and, and schools and, and all that good stuff that makes these cities so strong. So, yeah, there's definitely been a big push to um, the suburban markets, um, and which in turn helps. These John areas. calls them metrics. I call them community, creating community. Yeah, we have our first uh, planned new 13-story uh, mini skyscraper being developed, the Cove, yep. uh, for housing, too. 
testament of uh, the developer, right? He used to be a, he's a Boston guy doing a lot in Everett. Uh, we worked with him in the past, and well, he's out in Worcester now. So it's, uh, it's, it's in their name, on. Boston Capital Development. So I think that I think what you're seeing is that push, but really creating the the landscape prior to those developments was what really brought everybody there, mm -hmm. and that's creating the community. Well, we've we've seen a lot of uh, these multifamily projects that have been going up in a lot of the cities and towns north and south of Boston mm -hmm. and, and west of Boston, and it's it's creating a, a little bit of a change in the downtown areas in those districts in those regions. You can see some of these old uh, cities and uh, old towns. They had the old uh, sidewalks with the old storefronts in front. They're all being redone. Uh, you know, I, for example, Weymouth, downtown Weymouth. Yeah. Uh, the, a tremendous amount of multifamily projects being built there. Mm -hmm. And they're also all these new storefronts that are coming along with it. So it's it's giving a little more of a work, live and play, you know, with nice restaurants and different bars. And, and you know, it's not that far to the train, you know, in a lot of these cities and towns. So. I'd just like to say as a parting thought that I think uh, one of the themes that we've seen through COVID and as we're going to see the rest of the year, it's creativity. It's the ability to adjust, the ability to look at old buildings and, and see something new and see the towns uh, and cities and towns working with developers, allowing them to create drive up for pickups or drive throughs in their retail centers and allowing them to make those changes quickly. Uh, there's creativity on the lending side. Shyla mentioned c pace financing. There's also ground lease financing. There's a lot of bridge capital out there, private equity capital out there, mezzanine funding out there. I know we talked about the challenge of rising construction costs, but there's a lot of creative capital out there trying to help solve those issues. Uh, and I think we're going to need that creativity because as we get back to what we talked about as being normal, we're going to return to the challenges that we had before COVID. And that is, of course, the things that we talked about a little earlier today, housing, and making sure that we have the housing to attract the population, to attract the companies that we want to have here, and our, and our traffic and our, our transportation infrastructure, making sure that we don't get bogged down again when things are reopened, that we're not sitting in hour-long traffic, that our public transportation infrastructure is there, so that, again, we can be a target city and maintain our standing as one of the true... Uh, top-notch cities for venture capital investment so that we can all grow our meds and eds. Well, I want to thank everyone. We're just about, we are out of time. I want to thank Dave for moderating. I want to thank John and Michael and Shyla uh, for doing, uh, speaking this morning. A lot of great information. I want to thank everyone for attending today and I want to wish everyone a happy Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Rick. Thank you.